Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. In this bonus extended Q&A episode of the NEI podcast, we are interviewing Dr. Leslie Citrome. And I'm so excited to let people have the opportunity to get some of their unanswered questions addressed from the NEI Synapse Half Day that we had on novel strategies to treat schizophrenia. Welcome, Dr. Citrome. My pleasure. So the first question that I have for you is, this person asks, is there 100% overlap between medications for schizophrenia and bipolar mood stabilizers? Well, actually not. So we tend to think of the medicines that we have today for schizophrenia as generally useful for people with bipolar disorder. And sometimes that's true and sometimes that isn't. Many of the medicines are helpful for bipolar mania, for example, so manic or even mixed episodes. The second generation antipsychotics have often been studied in that form and have been approved by the FDA for that purpose. Mm-hmm. Only a small subset, though, have been approved for the treatment of bipolar depression. So the, that overlap is more limited. And if we look at the classic mood stabilizers, this issue comes up very frequently. Can I use lithium or valproate or carbamazepine in my patient with schizophrenia? Can I add it to their antipsychotic? Will they be better? And for that purpose, the evidence is very thin. And there are no classical mood stabilizers that have been approved for the treatment of schizophrenia. And this is not without trying. So studies have been done with, let's say, junctive lamotrigine, as well as adjunctive valproate, and they have not been successful in the treatment of schizophrenia. Okay, thank you. The next question I have for you, is there any scientific reason to use any antipsychotic in twice a day dosing? Well, sometimes antipsychotics are approved by the FDA as uh, twice daily to be dosed twice daily. And that's a consequence of how these medicines were studied by the manufacturer when seeking approval. And so they're locked into that recommendation. If they tested it like twice a day, that's how it's going to be recommended. But once it's out in the marketplace, many clinicians will dose it once a day and and get away with it. And largely that's possible because the levels in the brain are not corresponding directly to the levels in the blood. And so you do have adequate affinity to the receptors, adequate occupancy to the relevant receptors so that the drug can work that way. However, there may be some instances where it's given twice a day to avoid very high peaks in plasma concentration that can be associated with adverse events. If that's the case, then it's really suggested that you don't dose it once daily because it won't be tolerated once daily. But there are many instances that it can be given, and some classic examples include clozapine. And before quetiapine extended release was available, quetiapine immediate release often used once daily, or a senapine sublingual, for example. But keep in mind that you'll achieve higher than anticipated blood plasma levels. And if they're related to side effects, then you might get into some trouble. Thank you. The next question is, what are the most frequent comorbidities of schizophrenia? Well, by far the most frequent comorbidity is one that we often forget about, and that's tobacco smoking. So we can say that the vast majority of our patients with schizophrenia smoke cigarettes, and that's a problem. Cigarette smoking is equivalent to having the metabolic syndrome. And if people reduce or eliminate cigarette smoking, their life expectancy will increase and their coronary heart disease risk will decrease uh, substantially. Mm -hmm. I I mention it because we often forget about that one. Right. Other common comorbidities include uh, marijuana use, alcohol use, for example. Those are quite common. We'll also see symptoms of depression, which actually may qualify that person to have a major depressive episode, for example, and that needs to be treated as well. Mm -hmm. The next question is, if ziprazidone at 160 milligrams blocks 59% of D2 receptors, then it's hardly an antipsychotic. So 
would we push up the dose to get better D2 occupancy? What are your thoughts on that? So D2 receptor occupancy postsynaptically doesn't necessarily mean that that's how the drug is primarily working. And uh, we have examples of this, and probably the most famous example is clozapine. It doesn't block postsynaptic D2 receptors all that robustly, and yet it works as the best antipsychotic that we have, and particularly useful in treatment-resistant schizophrenia. We also have a new antipsychotic that just became available, lumetepirone, and that also has a low D2 receptor uh, affinity. And I'm talking about the postsynaptic D2 receptor. Mm-hmm. And yet it, it works as an antipsychotic. So what these two examples have in common is that they affect other receptors, mm-hmm. which in turn can modulate the appropriate neurotransmission systems in place and uh, decrease psychotic symptoms. So all roads maybe lead to dopamine, as I mentioned in my talk. Mm-hmm. But how they get there is, is a little differently, and it doesn't necessarily have to be by a postsynaptic dopamine D2 receptor occupancy. Okay, the next question is, with the olanzapine samidorphin combo to come out right around the corner, what makes samidorphin different than naltrexone? Is samidorphin available now to give separately for the treatment of metabolic syndrome with other antipsychotics? Well, samidorphin is an investigational agent. It's not available for commercial use. And it is being tested as a, a combination with olanzapine. It is quite different, samidorphin, from naltrexone in, in terms of its binding affinity to the mu opioid receptor as an antagonist. Uh, they both bind to the mu opioid receptor, but samidorphin has greater binding affinity. It also has a longer elimination half-life. So as a consequence, it'll behave differently. And it's been tested extensively in combination with olanzapine. So I would imagine that it'll get approved. That, that's my guess. And there's a lot of data to back up that strategy. Now, trexone, not so much. So the studies involving that trexone are fewer in number and involve fewer number of patients. The next question is, why are two second-generation antipsychotics worse than one second-generation antipsychotic and one first-generation antipsychotic or typical? So I don't know what, uh, what is meant by worse there. Another way to reframe this is that when we combine medicines, it is our hope that they are sufficiently different that you'll get some synergy of some kind. And giving both at once will be better than either one alone. And it's not just a, an added effect, but actually you're doing something a bit extra. And I imagine if you're combining two very similar antipsychotics, you won't get that. So we would think that the typical antipsychotic combined to an atypical antipsychotic, well, they're different enough. So maybe we'll get something out of that combination. But, you know, there are some combinations of antipsychotics that are considered combining two second generation agents together that actually make a lot of sense. And one example here is adding a small dose of aripiprazole to risperidone or paliperidone with the idea of decreasing prolactin elevation that's observed with risperidone or paliperidone. That seems to work quite nicely. Another rational combination is combining clozapine with aripiprazole. And they couldn't be more different, those two second generation of psychotics, although they're both SGAs, they're, they're quite different. And there's studies uh, establishing not only better tolerability of clozapine, but also perhaps boosting efficacy somewhat. Okay, the next question, this person says, the old question, how do you differentiate schizophrenia from schizoaffective disorder, from major depressive disorder, or bipolar with psychotic features? and also from schizophreniform disorder? Wow, (laughs) that's a big question. (laughs) It it is a big question, but it it actually can be answered quite simply, that the DSM-5 criteria are quite distinct for each of these disorders, Mm -hmm. and they have changed over the different revisions of the DSM. And actually, one of the bigger revisions has been in the schizoaffective diagnosis, and DSM-5 now emphasizes a lifetime assessment of how a person is doing. 
in terms of their schizophrenia symptoms and their mood symptoms. And this requirement for a more lifetime approach is quite different from the approach used in prior revisions of the DSM, where it was more focused on the episode itself. So now in order to make a diagnosis of schizoaffective, for example, you need to have a predominance of mood symptoms throughout the course of that person's illness. And that you are permitted, in fact, you do need some time without mood symptoms and just have schizophrenia symptoms. That's relatively brief. And this overall approach is expected to reduce the opportunity to make that diagnosis of schizoaffective. It's, it's harder to do. Now, in the end, it probably makes no difference because you're going to treat symptoms the way you see them. And if someone has psychotic symptoms, you need to treat those. And that's a fundamental approach to the treatment of the psychotic disorders. And if you see mood symptoms, you need to treat those as well. So it's a distinction, I think, without a clinical difference in terms of what you'll actually do in the office or in the hospital. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, how often do you use Tegretol in your practice as an adjunctive treatment with first generation and or second generation antipsychotics for efficacy and not worry about the drug drug interaction? I very rarely use it and I'll never, I'll never say never, but it'll be a long time before I initiate someone on adjunctive carbamazepine. There are a few problems with it. One is it's not all that well tolerated. And you do have to monitor uh, bloods in, in a way that you wouldn't for, for other choices. And uh, the evidence supporting its use in schizophrenia is quite meager. There's a study looking at aggressive behavior done in Japan that looked hopeful, but it hasn't been replicated in ways that would be convincing. And so the data that supports the use of adjunctive carbamazepine is pretty weak. And then on top of all that, it induces the metabolism of most drugs we use and induces its own metabolism. So we have a kind of a difficult medicine to use. I have to tell you, though, 25, 30 years ago, I did use it, uh, but we didn't have very many choices. And we were kind of desperate in getting our patients better. Okay. The next question is, are the M1, M4 theories derived from noting the efficacy of clozapine despite its lower dopamine affinity? Yeah, interesting question. So I don't know ultimately what the inspiration was to look at zonomaline, but it was studied some time ago and led to this paper uh, published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And basically the, the major obstacle in in studying it further has been the side effect profile. And so once that was uh, figured out by adding trospium, then it became a viable way of looking to see if it would treat schizophrenia. And we've known quite some time that the cholinergic system comes into play in the regulation of dopamine and glutamate. So it's logical if you can modulate that system to your advantage, then perhaps ultimately you can reduce the excessive dopamine neurotransmission that occurs in the ventral striatum in people with, with psychosis. And so it's just another approach where, you know, again, all roads lead to dopamine, but doesn't necessarily mean you have to block those postsynaptic dopamine receptors mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. The next question is, do you believe CAR-XT will be able to be used as an adjunct to clozapine? Well, it remains to be seen. There's going to be a lot of interest amongst clinicians to add medicines that treat schizophrenia, particularly if they have a very different mechanism of action. But I think people want to get comfortable with how the drug, if, if approved, how it is approved and what the recommendations for use are and get a handle on using it before venturing forth and start combining it. But I think it's inevitable that some combinations will take place because basically, we're desperate to get our patients better. Right. And very often we're stuck with patients who don't seem to be progressing in terms of their resolution of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, we often forget the most basic of all elements in successful treatment, that is adherence. And if someone is not taking whatever we're giving or prescribing or suggesting or recommending, then we're not going to see the fruits of our labor. And so we really want to pay attention to the adherence story. And that's why actually the new guidelines for treatment resistance and approach to treatment resistance schizophrenia adds the suggestion 
that try a long-acting injectable before concluding that that person has treat-resistant schizophrenia, because perhaps they never had a good trial of an antipsychotic. That's right. entirely possible. Right. So the advice given is try a long-acting injectable, make sure that person actually doesn't respond to that antipsychotic, and then start thinking about, is this patient treat-resistant? Okay. That turns us to my last question for you, which is, is olanzapine samidorphin available for clinical use currently? So, no, as I mentioned earlier, samidorphin is an investigational agent that's been tested primarily in combination with olanzapine at this juncture. And the idea here is uh, if approved by the FDA, it'll be as this combo. Right. And not yet available. And we should know in the not too distant future. Excellent. Thank you so much. This was sort of short and sweet, but this was great. And I'm so happy that people got a chance to get some of their unanswered questions addressed. Thank you, Dr. Citrone. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. And I hope to see everybody in real time at some point in the future. (laughs) Absolutely. We're excited. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by NEI Membership. The 2021 NEI Synapse Virtual Half Day Series is included with NEI Membership. Become a member today so that you can register for free for any or all of the monthly half days in which Dr. Stahl and colleagues will spend the last Saturday morning of each month sharing cutting-edge research and clinical insights on the topics most relevant to real-world practice. Don't miss out. Become a member today. Visit www.neiglobal.com to learn more.